my name is Brad Berkey. I am on the staff at the Westmont in San Francisco program. And um, tonight, rather than a lecture per se, uh, David and I thought it would be most helpful to do it interview style and to ask some questions, pose some questions to him, uh, kind of in four stages or four areas. One, to hear a little bit more about his life journey and story. Oh, it's outside. <laughs> I was wondering, is that my phone? <laughs> um, sort of who is, who is David? How did he get here? What is he doing now? And some of the backstory. And then to uh, have him reflect a little bit about his own experience at Westmont, as well as Westmont in San Francisco, and how that experience has, as he looks back, shaped uh, what he's doing now. And then a couple of questions around this whole idea of vocation. What am I going to do with my life? And sort of how that uh, formed for him. And then finally, uh, some words of wisdom and advice. What would David, as an accomplished professional now, want to tell his 20-year-old self sitting at Westmont College about uh, how to think about future and to be intentional about pursuing that? So um, I'm not going to do an introduction because we're going to allow you to do that now. And we're going to start with the present and work our way back. Okay. Um, so David, why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing now professionally and what the journey has been? So right now I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I've got a startup called Relay Media, which is um, a tech company. Um, and the, the, the product that we created is a, uh, an amp converter. And so I don't know, are there any, any CS majors, any computer science folks, anybody who knows how to build a website? Anybody's ever built a website in HTML and CSS? And like, um, so like if you've ever built a website, um, you use HTML, you use CSS, you use JavaScript to build a website. And um, the, the problem was that, uh, or the problem with HTML and JavaScript in particular is that it doesn't work very well on browsers on mobile phones. Mm -hmm. Very, 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 very slow. And so, um, so my company basically has a converter technology that takes standard web pages and automatically converts them into AMP web pages for publishers of content. So lots of media companies like Vice is one of our customers, TMZ is one of our customers. Um, but most of our customers are local media like newspapers, local TV stations, um, and that sort of thing. So it's basically a, a converter technology for publishing companies. Um, Bef before that, um, I uh, had worked at The Guardian for a year, which is a newspaper based in London, or a news organization based in London. Um, I had gone to The Guardian after a few years working at Google, um, where I was always in um, partnership uh, or strategy roles. And so the last my last role at Google, I was on this global alliances and partnership strategy team, and my, my focus was to um, think about how Google could interface with news publishers more effectively. Because they sucked at it for many years, <laughs> and it caused all kinds of major political problems. And so I had a lot of ideas about how Google could interface more effectively with the news industry, which I cared deeply about. Um, and so. Uh, um, so one of the things that I wanted Google to build was a, um, a universal syndication standard, which would be a way for publishers to distribute their content on the open web um, in a way that would allow their business models to go with it. And um, I couldn't get Google to do it. Uh, I tried and I tried and I was a strategy guy. I wasn't an engineer and I wasn't a product manager. And so in Google's culture, it's not, a, it's not my job to come up with things for Google to build. <laughs> So I tried to Jedi mind trick all my engineering and PM friends into coming up with this idea themselves. And if they did it, they'd get famous and it was going to be awesome for their career. And I failed at that too. So, um, so I ended up leaving Google to go to The Guardian because the CEO at The Guardian um, was willing to let me pull together a coalition of European media companies that had a lot of political influence in the EU, where Google had a lot of political problems. And, um, and with this coalition of influential media companies in the EU, um, I could take that as a uh, carrot back to Google and ask them to build what I wanted them to build. Um, that worked out a lot better and one of the things that I wanted Google to build was AMP. 
And so once we got that um, built in this kind of geopolitical quid pro quo relationship between a coalition of European media companies and Google, um, then I left The Guardian and I started my company to help publishers embrace this new web standard. So. And related to the work that you're doing now, um, what do you most enjoy about it and what do you find most challenging? So like conceptually, the, um, I'll start with like the role of the entrepreneur. Like there's, you know, I think there are, there's, there's entrepreneurs, there's managers. You know, I remember my, my physics teacher in high school, um, we thought he was brilliant and we were wondering why is he a physics teacher in high school, he's so smart. And he said there's fixers and there's makers. Um, and it's good to know what you are. And, um, and so he felt like he was uh, a fixer and that lent itself to teaching really, really well. And so he was a teacher. Um, I think for me, in, in, after, after Westman, I was in ministry for a while. There's, there's you know, opportunities in ministry where you start stuff up, and there's opportunities in ministry where you manage things. Same thing with an industry. You, you either are starting stuff up or you're managing things. And I always felt like my, my inclination was to, towards starting stuff up, towards creating things. I had friends who were really inclined towards managing things, and so they would go get an MBA, and they would follow a management track in their business career, and I thought that was really great. I liked starting things up. I liked the idea of a blank whiteboard and two friends, and we're gonna create a company, and create something out of nothing. And in doing so, I got to access that aspect of God's character that's creative mm -hmm. in my career. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like from a, from a you know, generally speaking, I. I love being the entrepreneur. I love starting stuff up because I get to access that aspect of God's character that is creativity. My friends who are managers, they don't start stuff up, but they care for people. Like they care for the people that work for them. And so they get to access that aspect of God's character. And I always thought, that's awesome too, but I think I'm built for this. <laughs> that's harder for me. <laughs> and so, so this is a little bit easier. So I'm going to hire people to do that when I have companies that require that kind of skill. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's, I think, one of the things that in, in an abstract way I love about being an entrepreneur. Um, when it comes to the work that I'm doing specifically with my startup, the technologies that we are um, helping to propagate across the open web are fundamental to improving the business model for quality and original journalism in the digital economy. And so everything that I work on is basically for the purpose of uh, improving the economics of journalism in the digital economy. And largely because when I started at Google, um, you know, I was interviewing at Google and back then it was like this crazy multi-month kind of interview process and it's almost like applying for a master's degree. You're kind of pitching a, a thesis. And so in every meeting I was pitching this thesis and the thesis that I was pitching was that it's not, it may not be Google's fault, but Google has been the biggest beneficiary of an epic transition in the media economy from a traditional media economy to a digital media economy. So like the way newspapers and TV stations made money traditionally is going away. And the way you make money now with media is online, but they're not making a very good transition so as a result, they're not making as much money. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they're not hiring as many journalists to work in the media companies, which means there's fewer people holding power accountable in our society. Mm -hmm. And so like today, there's probably about 50% fewer people employed as journalists than there were in 2006. So that means power is going unaccountable. Mm -hmm. And so like one of, the, one of the examples that I always use is, um, there was this guy who won a Pulitzer Prize for reporting on uh, the city, uh, city management team at Bell in Bell, California. Mm. And because he spent two years basically figuring out that this little town of like 20,000 people, the city council was paying themselves like a million dollars a year to run this little itty bitty town, totally embezzling all of the town's money. And uh, he, you know, started writing about it. And he was, I think, 27 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. He was like the rookie LA Times guy wins the Pulitzer Prize. And I'm thinking, how many towns and municipalities across the country is that happening where there's no reporter? Mm -hmm. There's nobody, there's nobody watching. Mm -hmm. There's nobody asking, there's nobody checking. Because how many local newspapers have gone out of business because of this epic transition from a traditional media economy to a digital media economy? Can I change the economics of that industry in a way that provides a scalable, sustainable revenue stream for those companies that employ those people 
that are required to maintain democracy, mm-hmm. you know, and to maintain our, 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 our liberal democracy, our, our structure of government. And so, like, the journalists in our society have to be there to do that. Otherwise, people get away with stuff, and pretty soon it's all a disaster. I used to, I used to you know, anyway, I don't want to get into the politics of it all, but... Uh, it was funny. I, I used to, I used to tell you know, I, you know, when I would go to journalism schools and talk about what I was working on, um, I say, you know, if we don't if we don't shore up the economics of this industry, um, it's you know one or two generations before um, you know uh, you know my kids are probably going to be living under some fascist dictator, hmm. and uh, and that was like two years ago. I, I said that, and it's like you know, did it, uh, yeah. So it's it's. it's it's turning out pretty weird, <laughs> and, and so so we need we need we need new, the news media industry to be actually a scalable and sustainable industry. And so all the technologies that I work on and all the business models that I'm focused on are basically around that that thesis that I was pitching several years ago when I first went to Google, which was I I want to commit the rest of my career to establishing a viable economic framework that supports original quality journalism in the digital economy. Mm-hmm. And if I can do that then I can maintain that fourth estate, that, 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 that industry that holds power accountable in our civil society. Mm. So. With regard to <clears throat> this passion for journalism, yeah. is it something that found you or did you find it? How did that coalesce for you? I, I stumbled into it. Um, you know, I was, doing, uh, I was doing some startups and then I was doing some consulting. When, before I joined Google, I was consulting a company um, at, with I was consulting for a company whose all their clients were news media companies. And they were trying to figure out like how to do more in Silicon Valley with digital type companies. And, um, and so I was really starting to get to know the, um, the news media industry. And then that was when I think I realized what, bad, what a bad shape it was in and, um, and how that needed to change. Um, because of the strife and the turmoil of the industry was becoming much, much more acute. Um, and, uh, and so it was really, I think it was really in that experience. And, and right before that, I had a startup where I was, I was developing a technology that I thought we were, gonna, we were gonna partner with local media companies, which is effectively news, mm. news, news companies, like local newspapers, local TV stations. And, um, and every time I would go in to meet with like the CEOs of these news media companies, these local media companies, um, I was always amazed at how depressed they were. And, um, and I remember meeting with this guy in um, a boardroom in, in uh, the Midwest. He was the CEO of a company that owned like 100 newspapers across the Midwest. And I had this, um, this product that I thought would go really well on his websites. And um, he had you know, thousands of salespeople that I thought could sell advertising inventory from, that resulted from the product that I would put on his websites. I thought this was a win-win, you know. Mm. But at this point, this was about maybe ten or fifteen, you know, twelve years ago. I, I didn't realize that he viewed me, this guy from Silicon Valley, as a representative of the barbarians that were amassing at the gate, about ready to destroy his <laughs> world. And so I walked out of there with no deal, but with a really clear sense that this entire industry is is in a state of decline. Mm. And um, and then I just was becoming more and more concerned that if the industry did actually continue its its um, cycle of decline that, um, uh, yeah, our, our uh, way of life was really at risk. Mm. So it sounds like there's a deep-seated ethical impulse mm-hmm. that also drew, drove you deeper into this field. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's, there's you know, you can always start stuff up. There's a lot of ways you can make a living, um, but I'm too lazy to just work if, unless I think it actually matters. Mm-hmm. So um, I really don't have the same work ethic that a lot of my friends have in, in the Valley. And so I have to feel um, motivated by um, this sense that it's mission, you know. And so otherwise mm-hmm. I'm totally not a good employee. So, yeah. Well, it's lower down on um, some of the questions, but maybe it's an appropriate time to ask it now yeah. because it's related. Is I think most of us in this room want to do work that's meaningful and not just get the job that's out there. Yeah. What advice do you have in terms of anticipating and m- mapping, if you will, a way to be intentional about doing work that matters? Um, you know, I think that, well, I, I, you know, when, when, when I graduated from Westmont, um, there was a pretty good recession on um, in, the, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, so there weren't really a lot of jobs to choose from. 
And, uh, and I think that you know, a lot of my friends that, that I graduated with probably spent the first few years um, wandering aimlessly through the economic desert you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, of, of Southern California, but really of, of, you know, of everywhere. And um, what, what I think we were, we were all really, really, really interested in majoring on um, mission, but uh, we didn't realize that what I think we needed to really focus on was acquiring skills that would allow for when we, you know, that when we got to that point in our career that lent itself to actually picking a mission, we could have something to add. Mm-hmm. We could have some value to provide. And, um, and I, felt, I felt like a lot of us kind of meandered for five to 10 years, actually not, not really focused on just acquiring skills that could then be put to work for a mission when that mission, when that mission emerged, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, mm-hmm. and um, and so like we, you know, a lot of my friends had silly jobs for years and years and years because they were just waiting for some, you know, bolt of lightning from the sky in the form of a job offer that was going to be so super fulfilling, and <laughs> and that just doesn't it doesn't usually work out that way. Um, sometimes you just have to go actually acquire some real skills um, so that you can actually provide some value to the world that you want to change. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And um, so I think that I, I, would, I would probably say don't get paralyzed by a need for mission. Um, it's amazing how when you're learning things, the mission will emerge. Mm-hmm. Um, it just always be learning. It's kind of like that, um, that, that there, there's this famous scene in this old movie called Glenn Clary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, where uh, you know, the, guy, the, the guy's giving like this, this pep talk to the sales team and he's like, always be closing. And he's like cussing at him, like, always be closing, always be closing. And, uh, and then I was teaching my kids how to, how to ski. Not really, because these days you can outsource that, so it's better for humanity. Um, you know, I told them I didn't want to ski with them until they could get off the, the chairlift by themselves and would not fall down. And so there's a guy over here. He's going to teach you everything you need to know until you're ready to ski with me. But then when they're skiing with me, I'd be like yelling up the hill, yelling down, down the hill, always be turning. <laughs> like just always be turning, A, B, T, A, B, T. I'm screaming up or screaming down the hill, like A, B, T. Because as long as you're turning, you're in control. And it's the same thing with your career. As long as you're always learning, like always be learning. If you're always learning something, you'll always be in control. Um, because every employer loves somebody who's always learning, mm. you know, and, and then and if you're just always learning something, then all of a sudden you stumble into something that is what you want to be learning about mm. for the rest of your life. And if you do that, you end up changing it, mm. evolving well, then, it or morphing it or whatever. Yeah, it leads into sort of the questions related to how Westmont in particular prepared you for what you're doing now. And it seems that uh, what you just offered in terms of always being in a posture of learning mm-hmm. is something that college students can do in the here and now. Yes. So often in college, we often perceive it as, I'm preparing for something I'm going to do later. And um, I think you're offering the invitation to say, no, what you're doing now in college is vitally important mm-hmm. in the skill building, yeah. even if you may not see it that way. So why don't you yeah. talk a little bit about your experience at Westmont in general, and we'll move to the Westmont yeah. in San Francisco after, but what, what role did that play in the formation as you look back? Well, I, you know, I majored in philosophy when I was here. I, st- I thought I was going to major in history, um, and, uh, and I really, 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 really loved history. Um, and, you know, but I thought maybe I should you know, check out some other stuff and you know, not you know, lock myself down my freshman year. And, um, and I, I, really liked, uh, I really liked literature. Um, I really liked a lot of things, but what I realized, for, for me, what I realized about philosophy was it, it, all the other disciplines were manifestations of ideas, and if I could just study the ideas, then I could understand all the other disciplines. Mm-hmm. And so it was really the most fundamental thing for me to study was philosophy, because if I could train my brain to think linearly, and logically, then I could understand anything else that I ever wanted it to understand. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so philosophy for me was really um, kind of like, uh, you know, exercise and kind of training mm-hmm. my brain to think about things. And I knew I probably wasn't going to remember, um, you know, the difference between, you know, um, you know, some of the philosophers, although it's amazing how some of that stuff just sticks <laughs> in your head and good for cocktail parties like 20 years later. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, but, I, but I thought that just 
the, the, the rigor of trying to understand what Kant meant in Fear and Trembling was, was shaping the way I would think about everything else. You know, and, um, and so I thought that was tremendous. I thought that um, studying philosophy here at Westmont, a Christian college, was uh, unique. My professors were Christians, um, and, uh, but, I, but I wondered, you know, my freshman, sophomore year, I wondered, um, is this the same like, philosophy degree that I'd get if I went to Stanford? Two of my best friends from high school went to Stanford. And so, and, and, the, and the, the cool thing is that Westmont finishes a month before Stanford does in the spring. Mm -hmm. So every year I would cruise up there and I'd go to two weeks of classes at Stanford before they would button down for their finals. So I went to lots of philosophy classes and the theology classes. And I, I can tell you, I got a better philosophy experience here than I would have had I gone mm -hmm. there. Um, and, uh, and the thing that I loved about it was that... Uh, the philosophy curriculum here was identical to the philosophy curriculum in terms of this, the classes that you take at Stanford, but having the, the opportunity to um, learn that curriculum with professors who are also Christian, who were, the other thing that I loved about Westmont, there was like no holds barred. It was unlike my friends that went to Biola, there are things you're not allowed to talk about. Whereas at Westmont, there was nothing that you weren't allowed to talk about. And so I dug that a lot, you know, and like, whereas at Stanford, there's things you don't talk about either, but for opposite reasons of Biola. And I thought Westmont was like this nice middle ground, mm. you know, intellectual middle ground where I could, I, you know, we could explore everything we wanted to in like a metaphysics class um, without it being like scary um, to anybody necessarily um, in in this in this Christian context, and so it was really I, I thought the you know studying philosophy anywhere is 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 I think what I probably would have done, and studying philosophy in a Christian college that was a liberal arts college, not a not a Bible college, like from a historical perspective, like Biola, mm -hmm. was amazing, um, and so I, I feel like that really uh, um, that was pretty, that was that was absolutely foundational mm -hmm. for me. I think you, you had Dr. Wenberg, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I had Dr. Wenberg for a class where it was just me and Wenberg because it was mm. like an ethics class that I was, I think I was on Urban the semester that it was offered. So then I asked him if I could just have it next semester. And he's like, just, you know, come in every other week. He'd give me a couple books I was supposed to read and then we would talk about it. But me talking to Wenberg about some book in, on ethics was really me just sitting and watching him talk about the book. And he was like, it was like watching him play tennis with himself. Because <laughs> he'd be like two sides of an ethical issue and he'd just be like, and I'd just be watching, watching him asking a couple questions to keep going to get through my hour and a half without him asking me by him, <laughs> you know, too much. Well, I also remember, one of the things I remember is one of his mantras was related to what you were saying that yeah. if we are people that trust that all truth is God's truth, mm -hmm. there should be no question or issue that we should be fearful of. Yeah. Uh, which, as you're saying, sort of defines the Christian liberal arts vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. church or ministry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, you know, we, we relied on that pretty heavily, at least when I was a, you know, a philosophy major here at Westmont, relied on that heavily that uh, there was, I guess, I guess like in, you know, the, 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 best, the best opportunities to go sideways when it comes to um, faith and philosophy is in metaphysics. Um, actually, probably also in epistemology, but it's really it's really easy in metaphysics where you're trying to decide what's reality, and so, and um, you know, and, and so is reality a bunch of different things all at the same time or not, and or or is it one thing, and if so, what is it? I mean, just the study of what is is metaphysics, and um, and so it's a lot. It's really 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 easy to study you know metaphysics in a philosophy class, and to end up in a intellectual place that is. Um, is 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 uh, mutually exclusive with what we believe as Christians, mm. and um, and so when we would have some of the conversations in in you know in some of my classes, um, you know some some you know I had one I had one classmate she would walk out of some of these conversations she should be crying, because of the implications of what we had just discussed, meant all that she believed as a Christian was not true, and I thought. We just went down a rabbit hole. I, I think we probably took a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> we should just go back over that direction. It didn't, I didn't think that we were somehow going to discover the invalidity of our Christian theology um, mm -hmm. 
by accident on an afternoon in a metaphysics class at Westmont. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't think that was plausible, but she thought it was possible. And so she was totally freaking out, you know. And, uh, but I, but I, loved, I loved the fact that we could actually go down those rabbit holes here, you mm. know. Because if we hadn't, I would have eventually. <laughs> you know, so inevitably, I would have gone down those rabbit holes. I mean, you know, being, being here at Westmont, it was amazing. I definitely had my opportunity to, to think, like, am I a Christian just because I grew up here? Mm-hmm. You know, would I be a Muslim if I grew up in you know, the Middle East? Would I be Jewish if I grew up in Israel? I mean, am I, am I a Christian just because of my surroundings? And, um, and so, you know, my junior year was an opportunity to really get all Cartesian and try and get... Um, you know, like uh, get back to fundamental things like, how, you know, how do I know? And so it was really, it was an amazing opportunity to have that kind of rigorous, skeptical um, episode in my life in the context of a place where it was safe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not like I was telling all my friends in the dorm that I was like thinking about not being a Christian anymore. Um, but I could have that conversation with my professors and I could have that conversation with my closest friends. And it was, it was legit mm-hmm. so and it sounds like because there was a reference point the common held sense of fundamental christian truth mm-hmm. amidst all its variants gives one permission it sounds like you experience to mm-hmm. ex- explore the full range of questions yeah. and ideas yeah totally i mean it was i didn't really grow up in a um like in the same environment that a lot of my friends here um grew up in where i yeah, i would characterize them all have a, as i'm growing up in kind of like a an evangelical suburban um, kind of uh, you know cultural you know American cultural experience. Like my mom's from Mexico, um, you know my uh, my dad um, is from you know outside Chicago and doesn't like to talk about religion, but is very you know serious about his faith. And um, you know I lived overseas, lived in Japan for a while as a kid, and uh, and so it was really you know we didn't I, I was new to the whole evangelical subculture thing. And um, whereas I think a lot of my friends were really, you know, that's all they knew. Mm. And so it was, re- so Westmont was kind of a uh, crash course in a, a particular subculture in Americana. Mm-hmm. So. so you come to Westmont, you choose to be a philosophy major, immerse yourself in the world of ideas. And then junior year, you get the wild hair idea to venture to San Francisco. And senior Atlanta. year, actually. Senior year. Yeah, because I RA'd. Year. The reason That's I right. did it was because I was an RA my junior year, and I wanted to get off campus and break some rules. Yeah. <laughs> senior year. Yeah. So truth be told. <laughs> yeah, totally. So regardless of motivation, yeah. what, reflect a bit on your experience at Westmont in San Francisco, then known as the Urban Program when you yeah. were there. Um, when you think about that semester, what... What were some of the formative experiences, influences, takeaways that you count as important now? Yeah, I mean, I had um, the, you know, the urban areas that I had lived in previously in my life were in Japan, um, or um, really Japan was probably the most urban setting. Other than that, it was mostly military neighborhoods. And so my, um, my, uh, experience with race was really in marine neighborhoods where the only color was green Mm. Um, until I moved to Southern California for high school where everyone hated Mexican people and I had never experienced that before and people thought I was Middle Eastern or Mediterranean or something they didn't know my mom was from Mexico Mm. so um, so I didn't I didn't I they didn't they didn't deal with me that way but it was that was like living in Southern California was the first time I'd ever really Felt, I mean, I'd been a foreigner as a kid in Japan, mm-hmm. and so I knew what it felt like to be a foreigner, uh, but I had never really experienced racism because in marine neighborhoods, there's, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just, that just doesn't happen. And um, so then when I came to um, Westmont, it was very subculturally, you know, homogeneous. And then when I went to urban, there was almost something kind of like refreshing about being in the city in that urban environment where everybody looks different and that was what I felt comfortable mm. with um, I think that uh, you know my um, and, and then I finally I think it was at that age where I could actually engage with the issue of race in a way that would inform my thinking and understanding of my surroundings rather than just experiencing race as a kid but not really being able to actually engage in that aspect of our society in a way that helped me understand what was going on um, and so it, in San Francisco Urban Program, it was, um, I interned at the Public Defender's Office. Um, 
which was super, super cool. Um, I, uh, I worked for um, uh, an attorney there who, um, she had you know, basically a swing role where she was filling in for a lot of attorneys. And so um, I quickly ended up in a position where um, I was in the felony division. So uh, they, they, they let me um, uh, you know, interview um, clients as they would get arrested. Um, prior to the arraignment hearings, and that was fascinating for me because then I would, I would write up some notes about about what happened, and then um, meet with their public defender, and and give that public defender some sentencing recommendations that I thought they should argue for in in chambers before the arraignment hearings because, in, you know, because in the criminal justice system, it's so overwhelmed that you try and plea everybody out before you even get to the arraignment hearing, mm -hmm. and so, and in and in California you have a right to be um, arraigned within you know, basically 48 hours of your arrest, which is interpreted as two business days. So the cops like to arrest you on a Friday, so they don't have to get arraigned you until Tuesday mm -hmm. if they don't like you, which only happens to black people in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was the, the strange thing is I was in the felony division, 95% or more of everyone I interacted with was African American from one of two or three neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. And it, after a while, it almost felt like cops were driving around, and if you actually stepped out of that neighborhood, you got picked up or something. And then, it, and then the thing that was shocking to me um, was, because uh, um, I was doing these interviews, like I would figure out like what happened, you know, what did you do you know, that you got arrested for, and it's a felony, so it's like bad stuff that they're getting arrested for. And um, half the time, they didn't do it. You know, 90% of the time the police report is wrong. Um, half the time I would, I would find that the defendant was trying to lie to me about what happened. The other half of the time the cop was lying about what happened. And I would watch cops perjure themselves on the stand every Friday afternoon. And, uh, and that was shocking to me. And then two of, the, uh, two of the guys that I would always hang out with for lunch were um, law students at Stanford and Bolt, mm -hmm. so really prestigious law schools. Mm -hmm. African American guys, Ivy League undergrads, really better educated than me, um, and uh, and I remember having a conversation with them. Um, this was in '93. This was in fall of '92, which still feels like modern times to me. But I guess, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like Before it was all like these folks back in the old days, you know. But uh, but yeah, so this is pretty modern time in San Francisco, no less. And they would tell me that every time that they would drive through Pacific Heights, they'd give themselves 15 extra minutes because three out of five times they get pulled over. And, uh, you know, so they would just schedule it in, mm -hmm. you know, and I had no idea mm -hmm. that that was happening. I mean, I had experienced racism in Southern California as a kid. Um, I had no idea the, the, the depth of the American experience that it was to be a black man in this country until mm -hmm. hanging out with those guys. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a shocker to me. Um, because I was under the impression that we were a more perfect union at that point in our history um, than apparently we, we actually were. Um, mm. So that was, and then also I think the, the other thing that I loved about, um, about Urban was just the, the opportunity to really engage with the complexity of, of political and public policy issues. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's this, there was this one day that I'll never forget where you guys you know, took us to the, uh, the roof of some single room occupancy hotel down in the Tenderloin. And, um, and you had you had some guy who was like um, a Catholic, like a Catholic Kelly Cullen. priest or somebody coming up and say, "Oh, we got to keep these things for the homeless people. We got to keep these things for the homeless people." And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." And then you had the guy who owned the building come up afterwards. He's like, "I can't make money as a property owner in America, you know, in the city." And Ed was like, "Wow, this is really complicated and hard." And um, <laughs> And I, I felt like we all walked out of there with a lot less certainty about whatever position we had going in. Mm. And that's a really good thing. Mm. Um, because then that allows for the dialogue to be a lot more interesting um, when we're not trying to argue our point, but we're trying to learn the other's position. Mm. You know? and, um, and so I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful day, and I was completely confused by it. Um, but that's kind of like one of those, you know, and then I think we did like 10 of those kinds of things on the urban semester um, that I thought were really, really, really important, um, important experiences, so. 
So it sounds like the internship experience in some ways uh, complicated your life and worldview in some ways, and yet you are talking about it from a very rooted place of faith. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you let's know, talk it, a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it, I think I think my faith was definitely um, helpful, although this is a funny story. Lisa Dewberry was my my boss, this really large African American woman who is an Episcopalian. And, uh, and so when I, when I was at Urban, I would always spend the weekend at my friend's um, rooms at Stanford, and I would go to church with them. But the church they went to is called Black Church. It's called Black Church because that's what they called it. And Floyd, the, the, the dean, was the preacher. and He was an amazing preacher. So my friends went there, and it was charismatic, and um, very charismatic. And I'm like, well, why, you know, why, you know, I remember asking Floyd, the pastor, you know, like, why is this called Black Church? That's kind of a weird name for a church. He said, because we do worship in an African-American style. So I go, okay, cool, whatever. And then, and then I'm driving, you know, because then Lisa would pick me up from Stanford and drive me, you know, on, on Monday morning, drive me to uh, the internship. She's like, where did you go to church? Well, I went to Black Church. <laughs> It's so awkward. So it's like very powerful black woman that I went to a place called Black Church for Church. And she's Episcopalian. And I had been to the Episcopal service. but She's really into her book of order, you know, and this very high church liturgical thing. And then and she goes, Black Church. And I'm like, why do they call that? Because they do worship in the African-American style. <laughs> and I'm telling this to an Episcopalian. <laughs> so, so I'm just like, yeah, that doesn't work. I'm like, I know. It's very awkward for me to tell you. It's such <laughs> And it, that's what they said, you know. <laughs> so it, it was really a, I mean, that, that was the thing. It's like, there's just, you can't, you can't put people in boxes. And um, so it was really, I forget what your question was, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll do a follow-up. Um, <laughs> your experience, I, I think, as most students who do our program, is unique. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the other experiences of your classmates or those who did the program that same semester. And what was formative for them as well. Yeah, I remember my roommate was at the, um, was at Juvenile Hall. Um, Chris Pipes did um, the, the Juvenile Hall um, internship. I think it was like a, it was like a, um, I don't remember specifically what he was doing, but I remember after the first like um, few weeks, I didn't want to hear about his day anymore because um, it was so depressing. And because uh, it was just, um, so depressing what he was seeing, like every time he would go to Juvie. Um, Alexis Goals worked at, uh, um, uh, at San Francisco General mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a, in a chaplaincy internship. Um, mm -hmm. And that was fun. Some days were depressing, some days were not so depressing. And we'd all be sitting on, like on the floor of the, you know, you know, of, of, of the house, just kind of talking about the day. and. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was a pretty, it was a pretty impactful experience, I think, for, for everyone that I knew, except for that one guy that was really into the Denver Broncos. Remember that guy? Vince. He was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he turned out, he turned out really well. He did? <laughs> okay, because... He became a psychiatrist. Oh, that Maybe makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Love the Broncos. <laughs> Yeah, well, crazy guy. But uh, other than him, yeah, I thought, yeah, I heard a lot, a lot from a lot of the classmates. Yeah. How about um, living in San Francisco beyond just the internship experience, which for you was very intense, mm -hmm. less so for some, more so for others. What was the experience of living in the city, uh, being outside the Westmont campus culture? Well, I, you know, I loved living in the city, and because it, it, it felt more normal for me. Um, just to have, to not, it, it felt much more, because that had been much more of my, I think, growing up experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, with just a lot of different, you know, um, a lot of different people around all the time. Um, I think that uh, um, I also really appreciated, and I, you know, I lived in San Francisco for 14 years, you know, after college, um, but I appreciated the, um, it's weird to say this, but I actually appreciated the the, the constant interaction with homelessness because mm -hmm. um, you could never escape it. And it's weird to say that now because it's getting worse and worse and worse. Um, 
and so I, I wish that I, you know, I wish that that problem could be solved. But, uh, but I, I, I think that I, I liked living in the city because it just you couldn't never. It's such, it's a small city, you know, and um, it's not like New York. And you, it's very, 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 very compact, um, and so you can't really escape the the real issues that are affecting um, so many people, um, and uh, and I always thought that that was. Um, I don't know. I think those were like daily reminders. You just walk out and you realize, you know, how tough, tough it is for a lot of people. Um, so, so you speak, you know, about the intensity of your experience at the program. Did you have any fun? I had a blast. <laughs> oh man. I, well, I was running a lot, and so from from the urban house, which at that time was in Pacific Heights, I would almost every day I would you know get home from the internship. I would um, just run to the Golden Gate, run across it, run up that hill, run back. And then try and make it back in time for dinner, you know. Mm. And um, I was probably running like ten miles a day, you know. And uh, and and what an insanely beautiful city to go for a ten mile run. Mm. Just staying on the corner, on the edge of the city, or instead of going across the Golden Gate, just go down to the beach and just run along the beach, which is usually like a, a, a it's like it's like a SEAL training exercise because <laughs> you're usually getting sandblasted as you're running south, and you're getting sandblasted as you're running north. <laughs> it's usually really, really, really windy. So it's not like you know a nice beach most of the time, but I thought it was really cool, you know, that I could just be running, you know, and then through Lands End. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time just running, running around the city, and mm. uh, and it was just so beautiful. Um, didn't get to partake of any good food because I was totally broke, um, so I didn't experience that till later in life. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was just an incredibly beautiful, beautiful city. And um, and then also you know cruising around town with Chris, my roommate was such was such a blast. He was a, um, a music major, I think, or a religious studies music major, something like that. And so you know we would we would be singing like in the back of the bus, like riding the bus, we'd be singing two parts, you know, to every song, and it was just so much fun, um, you know. And just also the the getting around on the bus was just. Um, like when I was a kid in Japan, I would just ride the train everywhere by myself, like when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. Um, and then, you know, in the States, you can't really do that. Um, and so, uh, so getting back into a city where I could just get around um, without a car was really cool. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, San Francisco's, uh, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience, which, which, you know, when I moved back a few years later um, and spent 14 years there before moving out of the city, about six, seven years ago. Um, it's a pretty important place. Mm. So. And what would you say to this crop of current students? Um, why might they think about doing a program like Bus One in San Francisco? Well, I mean, I think that um, I'd actually like to ask you guys, what do you think about the program? Or what, what, what brought you to this thing tonight? Is, if anybody wants to share, I mean, kind of, I'm just kind of curious. Like, are you thinking about the urban program, or are you thinking about it, and what, if so, like, what are, what goes into the consideration? If that's all right. Sure. Okay. That's good. Okay, we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to, I'm just kidding. You don't have to freak out. But I really, actually, I really want to know, like, what, why are you here? <laughs> We want to figure out what to well, do with our is, lives. This is my last semester here at Westmont, actually, so I don't have the opportunity to necessarily go to yeah. uh, Westmont in San Francisco, but it's my last semester, and I'd like to, I don't know, I just wanted to, it's called, what am I going to do with my life? It's like, <laughs> my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all. All right. So more about, like, what's next. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Leah's in my, I teach the English internship class. Oh, cool. So I encouraged mm -hmm. all of my students to come, because I was like, guys, it's literally on vacation. And yeah. Lisa Lamb showed up, so she's getting extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That works. That works. <laughs> well, part of what we wanted to do was to open it to question and answers. Okay, yeah. um, but part of what wanted to resource you on as well is to just offer some wisdom and advice. What, what would you want these students to know uh, as they think some more sooner than later yeah. uh, entering the world beyond Westmont? What, what advice do you have? What should they be thinking about? What should they be preparing for? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess one of the things that I, I think is um, helpful is, 
to not do things by default. Like I think that it's really, really easy to spend the first few years after college just doing whatever comes along rather than having a design. And, um, and so, you know, for me, it was, you know, after, after Westmont, I went into ministry. I was a youth pastor for two years at a Presbyterian church in Thousand Oaks. And then I worked at a um, camp in Southern California called Forest Home for a year um, before I moved up to Berkeley and I youth pastored at First Presbyterian Church in Berkeley. And, uh, and then I realized I'm not going to do ministry for a career. Um, I'm going to do something that business people do, but I didn't know what business people did. Um, I had friends who were in marketing. I had friends who were in investment banking. I had friends who were in sales, and they worked in those big buildings in the city, and I didn't know what they did when they were there. You know, like, I know that they're in those buildings, but I don't know what they're doing. So I was a youth pastor at First Press in Berkeley, and so I could see there, I could imagine my friends walking around in those buildings, and I don't know what they're doing. And, um, <laughs> So I took, a class, I took an accounting class at Cal, because um, I figured that might be a good start. And then I started reading books about different industries, because I figured, OK, I'm going to go into, into business. So I have to pick an industry. How do you pick an industry? Like, how do, you, how do I decide what industry I want to go into? So I, so I was taking this accounting class, and so I started looking at, well, what, what industries make the most money? And um, because if I have to work for a living, I'd like to get it over with as quickly as possible. So how do I make the most money? I can, so what industries make the most money? Oil, energy. Well, we're, we're Houston. I don't want to go to Houston. Like, because you got to live in the epicenter of the industry that you want to operate in. At least that's what I was thinking. So like, I have to move to Houston to be in that industry. Like, no. Well, okay, so that's, so energy is really Houston. What about the other, you know, cities around the country? So I'm thinking New York, banking, maybe. DC, government, no, I don't know. Um, LA, entertainment and film, you know? And then I'm thinking, well, what, what characterizes these regions? Bay Area, tech, you know, entrepreneurialism, tech stuff. And then I'm thinking, you know, I had friends living in different parts of the country and the thing is, in New York, what's the highest virtue? Mm -hmm. It's wealth, who has the most money is the coolest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In D.C., what's the highest virtue? Power. Whoever has the most power is the coolest. L.A., fame. Whoever's the most famous is the coolest. The Bay Area, who's creating more? Who's the most creative? Who's the most entrepreneurial? I'm like, and then I was like, oh, I like that as a culture, um, as a fundamental element to the region's culture. And then I was like, well, let me look at tech. And because I'm here in the Bay Area, I was living in Berkeley at the time. Software, hardware. Hardware has horrible gross margins. Software has insane gross margins. This was at the very beginning of the dot-com kind of upswing. So I'm like, okay, software is like the second most profitable industry on a per capita, like on a, like on a metrics basis to energy. So I'm going to go into software, and good news, I don't have to move to some other city. Um, <laughs> so even better. So I picked, I'm going to go into software. Um, but I didn't know anything about software, and um, so I couldn't get a job at anything that had anything to do with software. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, yeah, so a friend of mine um, from church that I was going to, he was the CEO of an um, insurance uh, brokerage risk management firm in San Francisco, and that was the division of a global corporation, and he wanted to create a division that was going to be selling to religious nonprofits. So, and he had seen me speak to um, Christian people about Jesus and stuff. And he thought I did a good job and he could teach me how to speak to religious people about insurance. <laughs> so, he's like, he wanted someone that could talk to large crowds of religious people just about insurance. And so uh, I didn't know anything about insurance, but I didn't have, a, I didn't know, no one else wanted to hire me either. And so I thought, well, this is interesting. So how do I, how do I now, like after the fact, impose some element of design on the decision for me to take this role when reality was it was the only job that I had, you know, and no one else is offering me. And, and the thing is that the insurance business was amazing because I got to look at, I got to really understand how do you understand risk, mm. where if you go into business, understanding risk is incredibly fundamental. And then as a philosophy major, you, I learned how to ask a lot of questions so that I could analyze risk 
rigorously. Um, and then I could apply that understanding of risk across a lot of different industries and a lot of different companies. But at the end of the day, it was insurance, uh, which is a horrible industry. Um, <laughs> because we were a broker, which meant, um, and this may be more information than, than you guys need or want, um, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, the, the brokerage business makes money by selling insurance um, uh, policies. And they get, a, they get a, a percentage of the policy premium, like the cost of that insurance policy. And we were selling to Fortune 500, um, large risk you know, commercial um, you know, policies. The insurance company whose policy it is the broker is selling makes money in two ways. Premium from selling the policy or capital that they've invested in the stock market that may be rising. So as the stock market does well, they make more money on their invested, you know, invested capital. They lower the policy premiums to be more competitive with one another. The brokers get screwed when the stock market's doing well. I thought, this is not a good place to be. And so, uh, so I, and I thought this was the upswing to the dot-com thing. So at that point, I knew a lot of people in the city and I ended up working at a startup. Um, we were doing some mobile software and, uh, and, and then I just started to learn as fast as I could about like, how does this stuff work? And, um, and so, uh, and then it kind of all went from there. Yeah. But I think, what was the original question? What, what advice would you give Oh yeah, give to I think it goes back to the always be learning. Mm -hmm. Try and have a design. I think that um, if, but I guess the real, the real tip is that if you don't have a design going into something, retrofit one mm. onto the way you characterize it on LinkedIn after the fact. <laughs> you can always create a narrative arc to your career if you try hard enough in retrospect. Um, and so it's like, yeah, and then, and, then, and then you'll get to a point where you can actually define the narrative arc in advance. But if you can try and understand the narrative arc in retrospect, that actually makes you sound a lot more interesting to potential employers down the road. So in my narrative arc now is, you know, everything that I do with my startup and, you know, advising, you know, media companies and working with Google and Facebook and all these companies that I spent a lot of time working with in the Valley, it's, it's like, how do I establish a more viable economic framework for journalism in the digital economy? And that's going to take different forms over the next 20 years. Um, but I'm going to give myself 20 years to feel like that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, try and try and have a design for what you're doing. If you don't have one going in, then try and superimpose one after the fact. <laughs> Always be learning, mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as you possibly can, because then eventually you'll end up, you know, I'll end up like wanting to learn about certain things. You'll find yourself gravitating towards learning about certain things. And that's usually when some mission starts to emerge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but always be learning and try and try and have some design to your career. Mm -hmm. okay. 